together from Sydney with my wife Susan. Susan, stand up. <laughs> she was my, she's, she's my GPS, my guide, my everything. <laughs> such. But um, yeah, it's a pleasant drive here, although you know we met a storm along the way. But uh, I told my wife, Peter, that I said, you know, it is because we forgot to pray. <laughs> so we prayed, and then when we reached Goldborn, everything was bright. And look at that, it's a beautiful day. Praise God. <laughs> um, I'd like to start my talk with a, with a story, you know, about um, many moons ago, I won't say when, <laughs> many moons ago, my wife and I wanted to leave Compass for Christ. Uh, as you very well know, uh, or probably you don't know, me and my wife almost started uh, with the family ministry. So first was uh, Youth for Christ, Singers for Christ, Kids for Christ, even Handmaids, you know. I'm not in Handmaids, she is. <laughs> and um, yeah, we established that with Tony Melotto, I don't know if you know Tony Melotto, etc. and all of that. And uh, we've been there, and then finally we settled on Singers for Christ ministry. So we have been there for a long time. Then out of the blue, sometime, you know, the elders decided, oh, Marcy and Susan, you're now in, not anymore the SFC coordinator. What? <laughs> you're not, uh, you, know, you have to step down and you uh, end up with a corpus for Christ in the household. We don't want that. And no one consulted us about this. We were hurt. Mighty hurt. And we said, well, I don't think, um, oh, oh, more precious egoistic uh, word during the time. It says, you don't have the monopoly of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I said, all right, um, well, uh, during that time, me like, and my wife decided, okay, we just let it go. All right? And uh, I was reading about that. So we went to work. Uh, that was a Sunday. Monday, we went to work. And on the way to work, I was still reading about this and said, uh, and we, we, we told our children about this, and our children were saying, well, you spend all your life with Corpus for Christ. Well, you know, for a long time, and why are you going to live it? And says, oh, because, you know, you want to live it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wasn't saying our ego was right, etc., but I was saying, you yeah, uh, know, not, we're not very important in this uh, ministry, in this Corpus for Christ anyway, so we just better live and let the others, you know, uh, have it. You know, the usual... <laughs> The usual excuse. But then, I was reading about it, went to work, you know, come back. In the afternoon, he says, okay, this evening I'm going to write my resignation letter and I'm just going to leave. So, the train stopped, waiting for my wife to pick me up at the train station. I was sitting there, I said, oh, maybe I bought this hot chips. <laughs> and the hot chips was soggy. So I took a bite, one or two, and I was holding it in my hand. He says, I don't think I can eat this, <laughs> etc. So, you know, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of uh, struggle, you know, struggling with SFC, and I'm struggling to eat this <laughs> hot drink, hot chips. Out of the blue, someone, someone came along, right? He was a homie. You know, he was wearing uh, dirty gloves, etc. Uh, homeless kid, homeless man. Pretty old, you know, uh, lumbering around. He approached me and he pointed at my chips, so I was holding it. And he says, Are you gonna eat that? So I said, No, I gave it to him. <laughs> Here it is, you know, take it, you know. I don't want it anyway. That's, that's one problem <laughs> away from me. And, you know, he, he said, Thank you, and he took out a pen. You know, he didn't know I collect pens, but I do. I collect pens, right? And he gave it to me. And I said, oh, thank you. And I look at the pen. And the pen says, La Luz del Mundo. Wow. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. It is a city, and the light in the city is not hidden. It has to be brought out in a lampstand so that the rest of the people in the house may enjoy that light. You are the light of the world. 
And with that word, he says, Oh my goodness, <laughs> what is this about? And I look around, he was nowhere anywhere, I cannot find him. You know, I don't know uh, how he could have walked so fast, you know, after reading those words and I look at him and I was finding him. And then I said, yeah, maybe this is what it is. This is what it means, you know, to be able to come to couples for Christ. This is the sacrifice that God wants me to be. But in this sacrifice, I know, yes, we can all be light of the world. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, he said, we're not looking back. We're going to stay. Whatever assignment we are being given, we will obey. And we will just go on and march on to become the light of the world. Amen? Amen. That was my spirit. Now, Can you read this with me? For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness. For everything that becomes visible is light. You know, in some translations of the Bible, that phrase there, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. You know, in some translations, it says, Now you are the fruit of the light in the Lord. You know? And, you know, how many of you are following this? <laughs> the fruit of the Holy Spirit is something that our national, our council has embarked on to have a sharing or household House, household uh, teachings this particular year to become the fruit in the light of the Lord light as children of light for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness but let's focus on that for you were once darkness for you were once darkness where did this come from? you know Genesis 1 in the beginning there was just darkness and chaos and God said, let there be light. That was the first act of creation. Let there be light. And that first act of creation produced generations and generations who gave us light. From Abraham, to no from Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to Jacob, to David, and then finally to Jesus. And when Jesus came, he said, I am the light of the world. I am the light and the truth. And then after Jesus, he said, I am going to give you the Holy Spirit who will make you understand everything that I have told you. Again, another understanding, another light that has come to us. God created mankind in His image, in His likeness, but before everything else, He gave light. That is the, that is the, the crux of all our imagination. That is the crux of our creation. Sorry. And our creation means we are receiving that light. And again and again, through the life history of our faith, we have received that light. It's very nice, isn't it? And also, it's not only the story of our creation, it is also the fruit of the Spirit that will be given to us. The fruit of light in the Lord, the fruit of light that produces every kind of goodness and righteousness. The fruit of the Spirit which is light, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, patience, etc. And all of those things are going to be the fruit that will be produced by the Spirit in us. As we follow that light, as we become the new creation that God intended us to be. As we become in the image and likeness of God, then we become to have that fruit of light. This, brothers and sisters, is, not, is something that become, comes to our awareness and says, Ah, oh, this is what I am. This is what we are made to be. We are made to be children of light. Okay. So, the interesting.
introduction. <laughs> Rekindle and fulfill our ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. What is this? This is our theme last year. Last year, you know, we embarked on, we said, okay, let us get our gifts and let us rekindle these gifts. Let us make these gifts. And what did we do? We said, okay, here are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All right? The Holy gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is prophecy, etc., and all of those things. That is for the benefit of all the community. These gifts are given to us so that we can help the community. We can prop up the community. That was the first thing. Palo ba? Now, this year, we bring rekindling and fulfilling to the next level this year. Right? We have that gift. We have been asked to rekindle those gifts. But now, we are going to deepen that rekindling. Secondly, we are going to live as children of light. How do we rekindle? We are going to live as children of light. St. Paul's teaching on the Ephesians. Later on, I'll tell you more about that. But more of that, this is the call for the Christian culture of CFC and our family. This is a call of our Christian community to be able to deepen that rekindling, to be able to deepen those gifts and make us and your family and all, all of us here in CFC become children of light. You follow me so far? Yes. Alright? This is becomes then a holy way of life manifest God's light in the world. If we live like this, then it will manifest God's light in the world. God's light will shine and radiate from us, from Corpus of Christ, throughout all the world. That was the intention of our leaders. Right? So, this is it. Awake, O sleeper. It's the first part of the theme. Away, O sleeper. A study shows that for an average lifespan of 71 years, we spend 23 years sleeping, 17 years working, 11 years relaxing, 6 years driving, 3 years eating, 2 years dressing, 6 months attending church services. <laughs> and, you know, don't worry about it. I added it. It's, it's, it's not 71. It's 68.5. <laughs> right. So there's uh, about one and a half year missing. <laughs> we do nothing, all right? Then, but then, we look at this and says, you know, probably we're not praying enough, right? Probably we're not, you know, evangelizing enough. We spend most of our time sleeping. We give little time to prayer. We give God little of our time that God calls us to awake from our sleep. Awake from our apathy. Awake from our complacency and rekindle the fire of the early years in the community. How many of you here uh, have been in Corpus of Christ for the last 10 years? How many for the last, you know, uh, five years? How many for the last two years? Oh, yeah. this is, uh, <laughs> we need more people, right? <laughs> but when we rekindle, we remember those years that we have, and we say, you know, we used to be like this, we used to be like that, we used to have this, this, but now we are slowly sleeping away. Sleeping, not sleeping. <laughs> sleeping away. And, the, and, and our theme for today says, away from that slumber. Away from those times that, you know, we seem to forget everything that has happened to us. How many of you remember your, you know, uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit or receiving the power of the Holy Spirit? When we received that power of the Holy Spirit, you know, we were so fired up. You know, we were going on missions everywhere. <laughs> we were going to every place uh, in Australia to be able to build up SFC. Awake from that slumber. Awake so that that can be fired up and be kindled again. Alright? So, first biblical passage on awake or sleep. First Peter Chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. Can we read it again? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own. The praises him. 
Once you were no people, but now you are God's people. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Arise, shine now, for your love has come. Isaiah. It is as if Peter is paraphrasing Isaiah here, the prophecy of Isaiah that says, there will be light. In spite of the temple being crushed, in spite of no kings around to govern us, Isaiah was prophesying, there will be light in the world. Because we are going to have a king, because we are the chosen people of God. This is what Peter was paraphrasing. That you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You know, I was looking at this. And I was reminded of what um, this Father Mike told in, in one of his podcasts, in one of his, uh, in one of his, um, in, in one of his uh, YouTube. <laughs> right? He said that you know what? When you go to mass, are you just a spectator? And he says when you go to mass, that priest is the ministerial priest. He is giving a sacrifice. When he says royal priesthood, what does that mean? It means that by your baptism, you are, we are all kingdom priests. So when we go to Mass, right, it's not only the ministerial priest who is going to offer the perfect offering, which is Christ. But we ourselves, as kingdom priests, have to offer something for that Mass. What do they say? The heart of every worship is, the heart of every religion is worship, the heart of every worship is sacrifice. There can be no, sacri there can be no worship without sacrifice. When we come to Mass and we come to our little household prayer meeting and we come to worship, alright, do we say, you know, we're just going to sing and we're going to recite, and we're going to recite all these prayers, it's just that. Is that only about, you know, praying and work? No. We have to say, what am I going to sacrifice today? What am I going to die with today? You know, in the biblical sense of dying, etc. That is what it means to become priesthood. A holy nation. So that, but it doesn't say that, you know? You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. But you have a purpose. And the purpose is to announce the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. In other words, you know, you are being chosen, but chosen not because, you know, you are body body or you have this crown or you have this jacket, etc. But you are chosen because for the purpose of proclaiming that marvelous light that God has given you. In us, in Corpus for Christ, what is that marvelous light? That marvelous light is our life in Corpus for Christ. That marvelous light is when we receive that spirit in us that gave us that gift. That marvelous light has to be announced to the whole of the world. That is what it means to be children of light. That is what it means to be able to be awake. Once you were no people, but now you are God's people. You have not received mercy. But now, you have received mercy. And I reminded Sister Faustina, when she said, you know, you cannot embrace mercy. If you cannot embrace the mercy of our Lord, be prepared to embrace the damnation of the evil one. Wow. <laughs> Alright. Are we embracing God's mercy? Are we saying, oh, I don't need to be, I don't need to be merciful. <laughs> There's such a word. I don't need mercy. But yes, we need mercy. Alright? But because this is the mark of our creation. This is the mark of who we are. That we are chosen people of God. And that mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that mercy of our God is available to us. Later on, I'll tell you what it means to become simple in, the, in, the, in, in what the Lord is giving. St. Paul's teaching to the Ephesians, Awake, O sleeper. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. 
was St. Paul's teaching. Let me... Before I can. You know, Ephesus is a very important base for St. Paul. Ephesus is right at the center of the Asia Minor region. You know, St. Paul visited a lot of places in that area. But he always returned to Ephesus. That was his base, you know? Like, you know, we go on mission everywhere, but we always return to our household, right? But St. Paul has this Ephesus as, as his base. So the people of the Ephesus, the Ephesians, they're not bad people. They're good people. As a matter of fact, when St. Paul was writing this letter to the Ephesians, he was praising them. He was praising them and he was saying, how good you are. How I am blessed that you, I have you as my church, as the church of Christ in that area. But then, after that, he says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. He says, that, how, am I going, how is Christ going to be in your lives? And he said this, a very long chapter, 425 to 620. And he enumerated them one by one. Practically, you know, you, you shall not covet, you shall, you, shall, you shall not gossip, you shall tell the truth, you shall, you know, be not be angry, you shall, oh man, that's a lot, all right? And I advise you, I'm not going to rattle this off because I mean, it's something that you and I probably will have to read tonight. But it's chapter 4, 25, 620, it starts with, therefore, each of you must put off, blah, 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 etc. And then, However, it ends with him asking for prayer in the fulfillment of his mission. Like us, you know, you know, there are some people of us who, who will go somewhere else, etc. But we all need prayers. We all need prayers of the congregation. We all need prayers of the entire community. That is what gives us light. Amen? <laughs> it's not, you know, sometimes you feel all alone in your mission. Sometimes you feel all alone in your household. Sometimes you feel all alone in your CLPs. Sometimes you feel all alone in, what, in, in chapter assemblies because your, your household, your household, your co-household mates, etc. are not here. But then, you know, that aloneness should prompt you to ask your members to pray for you. To pray for everyone in this community who is doing that radiating the light of the world. The light, the light of the world. Right? Awake, O oh sleeper. This is the message to our community. Awake, O oh sleeper, do not feel comfortable. Do not be complacent just because the community has grown. Do not be too confident of our strength in numbers. We need to constantly pray. To constantly call on the Lord. Away from your sleep. You know, there are three there are three stories in the Bible, you know, that reminds me of this awakening. The first is the parable of the ten brides. You know? You know that story? You know there were there were ten brides who were waiting at the door, but then the bridegroom is not coming yet, so they slept. <laughs> right? Now there's the other ten. You know, anticipated that the bridegroom would be coming, so they stayed awake. All right? And then when the bridegroom came, right, the doors were closed, the ten bridesmaids who slept were left out. Alright? Why don't you buy your lamp so that it can be lighted and they come back, you know, the bridegroom is already gone. Alright? Stay awake. <laughs> the second story is the story of the Gethsemane. If this is the apostles of Jesus. This is the people who have been with him all the time. You know, these are the people who, who were preaching in Jesus' hands. They were feeling all the miracles, all the teachings, all the healing. They were witnesses to what Jesus was saying. And then on the last day when Jesus was at Gethsemane, he said, Can you not, Jesus was complaining to them, Can you not just stay awake even for a little while? Why do you think Jesus was saying that? Why do you think Jesus was remonstrating to Peter, please stay awake? Because Jesus is afraid. This is his own humanity. I'm going to face death. These people are coming to arrest me. 
please stay awake. Jesus himself was calling upon us. Please stay awake. I cannot do this on my own. You will become my eyes. You will become my hands. You will become my ears. You will become my legs. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to reach out to those people. Please stay awake. This is what Jesus is telling our community today. Stay awake. Be with me. The last story I'm going to tell you about waking, about waking up is the transfiguration. Yeah, so he brought this guy, Peter, James, and John again up to the mountain, Olivet. Oh, Tabor, I think. Mount Tabor. And they were there. And way down by sleep, Peter was again falling asleep. But then he was fighting his sleep. He was trying to be awake. And what happened? Wow. He was given the vision of the transfiguration. In other words, <laughs> Christ was saying, if you only stay awake, you will see the glory that I have appropriated for all of you. If you will only stay away, I'm going to give you a vision that will stay in your memory forever. I will give you a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of what it means to be in the kingdom of God. And they saw that because of their fighting sleep, because of their fighting and wanting to stay away, they saw that they were given that beautiful and magnificent vision of the transfiguration. So much so that they say, let's stay here. <laughs> let's stay here, let's build a tent, one for you, one for uh, Elijah, Elijah, one for... And Jesus said, no, we're not going to stay here. We're going to go down. Because down is where you will be fully awake. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. So, he said, okay, the next part of this talk is arise from the dead. After a while, awake, we arise from the dead. We die spiritually whenever we sin. God calls us to arise from the death of sin. He gives us new life so that we may sin no more. We die whenever we sin. Oh, God. Brother Marcy, where did that came from? Okay, what's up to ask for Ponte? What kind of Ponte did that came from? Back to Genesis. Remember? When God created Adam and, Adam and Eve, there was light. They were given the firmament, you know, it filled up the heavens, the earth, etc., and all of those things. I don't know what happened. Adam and Eve sinned. Right? Then after Adam and Eve, there was Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Cain sinned. Then after Cain and Abel, there was Noah. And the people were sinning. So God sent, you know, the flood, right? And then after the Noah, then there was the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel said, okay, let's reach out, you know, let's make a name for ourselves. And the people sin. You know, sin of Adam and Eve, sin of Cain and Abel, sin of Noah and the community that Noah lives in, sin of the Tower of Babel. What is this all about? When you, when you are dead, you are because you are sinful. How are these four incidents sinful? How? Because they wanted to be God. Right? The devil was tempting Adam and Eve. He says, you know, no, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. Right? Uh, and Cain, right? Cain was saying, oh, I want to offer my own offering. Alright? I want to offer the kind of offering that I want. So God, you know, favored the offering of uh, Abel. So he killed Abel. Abel. He says, you know, I, 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 I will determine what offering is appropriate. So I am God. The people rare in, in, in the flood, in Noah's flood, what they, they said, you know, let us fashion a God after them. They, they, they were sinful. They, they, they're sinning against God. They're not following the God that told them 
you must trust me. You must worship me. But they worship other gods. The Tower of Babel saying, let's make a name of ourselves. No, God is there, but you know, let's reach out to heaven and let's make a name of ourselves. Whenever we sing, whenever we think that we can outdo God, then we sin, then we die. What happened? But God was always, but God was always, but God was always pardoning them. What happened? There was, there was the sin, there was the punishment, right? The punishment to Adam and Eve was that they suddenly felt they were naked. The punishment to Abel and Cain is saying Abel was fearing death. Uh, so Cain was fearing death. The punishment for Noah is that there was that flood. The punishment for the Tower of Babel is that they cannot understand all themselves anymore because of the many languages that they speak. Right? But then God gave them a way out. The, the way out, the way, the way out for, for Eve was that God fashioned clothes for her so that she will not feel ashamed anymore. The, the, the favor of God came to Cain as well. He says, I'll give you a mark so that you will not be afraid that other tribes will kill you. And the favor for Noah is that I'm going to give you an ark and you can, you, you, you can save these people. The favor that he gives to the Tower of Babel is that he created Abraham. He called Abraham to become the father and the name among all other names. So there, when we sin, we die, there is the punishment of death. But then God will always bring us up. This passage in Ezekiel, all right? About the dry bones, all right? That even the dry bones, when we sin, when we die spiritually, we die spiritually when we sin. But even the death, even the dry bones, God will raise us up. Arise from the dead. Huh? Just as we die, God will always bring us up. And the story of our gener the story of our creation, the story of Genesis, is not much different from us. We also sin. We also die in the sense of dying in a larger, in a biblical sense, right? We die to our material needs. We die to our pride. We die to our, you know, lasciviousness. We die to our ambitions, etc. And when we bring that death, when we bring that dying, we bring that sacrifice to the Lord as well. And that makes us arise. Arise from the dead. During his annual death and penitential service on 9th of March 2018, Pope Francis said, Can we read it? So you see, first it tells, first this passage tells us to awake. Second, it tells us to arise. You know, arise because we die because of our sinfulness. Arise because. We die because of sin. However, God will always give us a way to come back to Him. Right? And that's what Sister Faustina was saying, isn't it? Embrace the mercy of God. Because if you don't, you might as well embrace damnation. Right? So, for this reason, God calls us, arise from the dead, Sin no more. Uh, somebody told me, sin is like God is offering you all these gifts. And then you turn your back and say, I don't care. Right? What is the gift of Corpus Christ? We always say, oh, Lord, thank you, Lord, for giving us the gift of community. It is as if the Lord is giving you this gift of community and says, I don't care. 
Lord, we thank you for giving us the gift of service. It is as if this God is giving you the gift of service. And then he said, I don't care. I'm happy with my football. I'm happy with my sports. I'm happy with my Netflix. Right. God gave you the gift of inviting you or, or, or introducing you to people who can hear His word. It may be your office mate. It may be your relatives. It may be your friends or enemies, your best friend, to give them CLP. God is letting you offer, offering you to that. And He says, oh, I wouldn't be bothered. I don't care. Right? We, see, we think sin is only, you know, uh, adultery, <laughs> etc. We think sin is only stealing. Sin is only the Ten Commandments. Well, it's simple. We die whenever we say, God is giving you this gift. And yet you turn your back away from Him. He says, I don't care. How do we see CLP? How do we see our service in community? Do we see it as service? Do we see it as a task? In a way, it is. You don't want to see. But in a way, it is also a gift that comes from God, isn't it? Amen? Amen. It is a gift that God has a problem. He is not giving this gift to somebody else in the street. He is giving this gift to you. And did you, did you turn away? Did you turn your back and say, I don't care. Sin no more. Arise from the dead. Rekindle the fire. Live as children of light. Hello? <laughs> rekindle the game, rekindle the fire. This is what it means. You know, do we live our members, our missions, our family? Right? Our workmates. We have this world as a gift. Everything is gift, right? Yes. And then we turn it away. You know, I don't care. And the best gift that God has given us is the command, be children of light. Do we turn our back away? Says, I prefer darkness. <laughs> I prefer chaos. You know? I prefer you know, to be in the dark. What do they say? Whenever people are in the dark, you know, that's something like something fishy about that, right? Everything that is in darkness, something fishy. Anyway. How have we rekindled the gifts? The gift the Lord continues to reveal, CFC as Christ-like. This is what the Lord is always telling us. Not only the Lord, the Vatican, not only the Vatican, even our parish priests, even Australia is telling us, CFC is Christ-like. The legacy we have to pursue. Right? With that, with, with, with that revelation that we are Christ-like, the legacy that we have to pursue is that we have to build a culture of love aimed at renewing the family and molding a generation of family evangelizers. So that gift has a responsibility to it. That gift of CFC given to us it's a responsibility that the Lord wants to see in us if we are truly children of light. And with that, What a sharing, isn't it? Yes. You know, how would you... Uh, you, you know, there's a certain kind of uh, elatedness, there's a certain kind of uh, happiness when you see the people that you evangelize become leaders themselves, isn't it? Right? I remember the greatest joy, for example, the latest, greatest joy that Susan and I have is when we had that... Um, uh, presentation on, on, on the 30th anniversary of CFC. We really, last year, we really thought it's impossible, you know, to be able to get this through. But we got it through, you know, and um, it was not because of us that it became, you know, a success. 
It was because Christ, God was in there. And when God was in there, we saw that beauty. We saw that happiness that comes into our life. In our life in CFC, whenever we see household or assemblies like this, when we, see, when we hear about shielding like this, we say, God must be in this community. God must be there. And that gives us a certain happiness. That gives us because we become children of light. So, how do we become children of light? All right? We must live in goodness, righteousness, and truth. You know, this is again, you know, part of the, this is again part of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Uh, but our elders and our uh, church leaders have something to say about this. Goodness. For Pope Francis, goodness means showing loving concern for each and every person. Each and every person, especially children and elderly, those in need, caring for one another in our families, building sincere friendship in which we protect one another. You know? this, is, this is the goodness. You know, the term goodness is probably one of the most uh, difficult to interpret in the Bible. You know, it means uh, goodness of heart. It means goodness that you can give. It means goodness that uh, are in the entire community as, a, as an adjective. Right? Something, there is something in goodness that becomes godliness. And, and Pope Francis is saying this. Pope, I'm oh, no, sorry. Yeah, Pope Francis is saying this. He's saying that it is about love. It is about the loving concern that we have for each one of us. No matter if she has a heart, no matter if she has a, a cross eye, no matter if she's an enemy, that loving concern will always have to be there. Right? The second, goodness is my home and the place where I feel safe. You know? If you are going to describe, describe our home, can there be a home where there is hate? Can there be a home where there is indifference? If this is a home, then there must be goodness in here. And if there is goodness, then there is home for all of us. Yeah? Righteousness. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You know, this is... Uh, righteousness is a part of goodness. This, this takes the second side of goodness. Righteousness is about the statutes of the Lord. Righteousness is about, you know, the law of the Lord. Righteousness is about, you know, human law. Righteousness is also about the moral law, etc. And all of that. Noah is the first person in the Bible to be called righteous. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. When everyone else was sinning against the Lord, Noah was righteous. Right? And that was why he was given that place. St. Paul provides another perspective about righteousness in his letter to the Romans. He says, Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And also in Romans, you know, what did he say about, you know, about us? In Romans, St. Paul said, be conformed to Christ. That is what he's saying. You know, he's saying righteousness is about being conformed to the life of Christ. Righteousness is being about Christ-like etc. Okay? Since faith is a gift, righteousness is also a gift from God. And finally, what is truth? What is truth? You don't know the truth. Remember that? You cannot handle the truth. <laughs> you know, that kind. Right? But this question was even asked by Pilate to Jesus. What is truth? Pope Francis said a very practical concept of what the truth is. And it is very practical and it is very straight eye, bang, bush, bush eye. <laughs> he says, <laughs> can you read this? Beware, a gossiper is a terrorist because with his tongue he hurts the bomb and lives calmly. But the thing that is hurled, the bomb says, destroy others' reputation. <laughs> True, isn't it? 
You think about truth, you know? Gossiping is about truth. Uh, and slander. Yes, I said, teach of mercy. If it's the truth, you know, then it should not be a sin. It is a, even if it's a truth, if it brings people down, it's slander. If it, even if it is the truth, if it brings people down, if it destroys his reputation, then that's slander. But, you know, Pope, Pope Francis is right there. <laughs> you know, you become a terrorist if you gossip. That's what he's saying, isn't it? You're a terrorist. If you, it's like, you know, you put up a bomb and then you left. You don't care, boom. Okay? Don't forget, <laughs> to gossip is to kill. Don't forget, to gossip is to kill. <laughs> Alright, the call of Jesus. Jesus calls, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and I will give you light. Right? The call of Jesus. You know, this call of Jesus reminds us of the first time Jesus called his disciples, right? I remember one time, we were in SFC, and there was this brother, Brother Mark. He asked us, why do you think that when Jesus calls so many followers, I wish we could be like that, no? We just, we just point to a person and says, have a CLP. Have a CLP. Have a CLP. Have a follow. I wish it could be like that, isn't it? But when Jesus calls, Jesus calls, come follow me, and they follow. Come follow. And then Brother Mark was saying, why do you think, you know, that happens? He was all dumbfounded. And he says, oh, because he's God. You know? And he says this, because Jesus' word has power. Because Jesus' word has power. And that is why the call of Jesus to us has power. The call of Jesus to us need not be ignored. Because that power that comes from Jesus strike us, boom, right in, the, right in the bull's eye, right? The call of Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to him, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said to them, come, you will see. So they went and saw where he lives. And they stayed with him that day. The first call of Jesus to his disciple is come. Come here. Right? That's the first call of Jesus is to come, to know Him, to love Him, to experience Him, to be with Him. That's the first call of Jesus. Hey, but that's not all. <laughs> There's some more. The second call of Jesus is, then He called them, then He said to them, All, if they want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. He calls you, come. But that's not the end. Follow me. Did that seem good? It was not enough that we come to church. It is not enough that we pray. It is not enough that we call Him Lord, Lord. But we must follow Him. Carry our cross. Carry our sacrifices. What did I say? The heart, of every the heart of every religion is worship. The heart of every worship is sacrifice. Jesus calls us to that little bit of sacrifice that He gives us. He calls that us to follow Him, follow His way. Right? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark chapter 1 verse 15. Jesus' mission proclaiming the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in me. There is that element of time which is now. There is element of the kingdom which is a place. And there is that element of belief of faith which is wisdom, understanding, and enlightenment. The time has come. Repent. Don't anymore say, I don't care. Don't anymore say, you know, I am too busy. You know what busy means? Huh? This is an acronym for busy. B-U-S-Y, right? 
Oh, not the television says, I'm busy. <laughs> There's a problem on the television, I'm busy. Oh, yeah. Okay, say you're busy, I'm, but my name is busy. And I say, there's busy, as the B-U-S-Y. Being under Satan's yoke. <laughs> this one, right? Being under Satan's yoke, not Jesus' yoke. Come to me and bring my yoke, my yoke is easy. That's bringing the yoke of Christ, right? That is what he is in sacrifice. That is what we mean when we say, I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to carry Christ's yoke. But when you're busy, you're carrying Satan's yoke. <laughs> Repent and be company. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark 1, chapter 15. Come, follow me, sister. Come and do my bidding. Come and follow me and become children of light. Awake, arise. Okay, now. <laughs> the now we come to fulfillment. And if we come and become children of light, then what do we produce? We produce what Pope Paul VI, I think, called God enlightened space. God enlightened space. If we are children of light, then wherever we go, we bring light to that space. Amen? So, oh, okay, not Pope John Paul was, it's John, Saint, okay, they say Pope Saint John Paul II, yeah. Yeah. you said, you have to say that, uh -huh. uh, the, 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 the PowerPoint came from the Philippines, <laughs> Pope Saint John, Pope Saint Paul, Pope Saint, Pope Saint John Paul II, who first used the term in the Pisa Consecrata, let us read this, in community life, then, it should in some way be evident that more than an instrument for carrying out a specific mission, fraternal communion, is a God-enlightened space in which to experience the hidden presence of the risen Lord. When we do our bidding, when we follow Christ, it is not because of fraternal communion. It is not because of social work. It is not when we do our work for the poor, it is not just because of human social freedom. It is because we know that that is where Christ's enlightened space is. When we go and work with Angko, why is must why is Angko right so successful even if there are only volunteers as far as Angko is concerned? Because we realize that our work in Apo is God-enlightened space. It is not because of us. It is not because of a fraternal community. It is not because of anything else, but God-enlightened space is realized in that area. When you go on mission, you know, Susan and I go on mission for Solomon Island, you know? And the Solomon Island, we don't know if they understand us. <laughs> because they speak like this in English. They speak pidgin English, all right? And 85% of them, you know, didn't go to school. But when we're there, we realize that this is God and light and space. When everyone else is praising the Lord and sharing and clapping and dancing and raising their hands, we can see that that is a Christ and light and space. And that is the beauty of what we mean as becoming children of light. Because where we go, we enlighten that space. Amen? So be, clap your hands for all of you, for us to try, because I'm going to tell you this is how we map our enlightened space. Right? This is part of remembering. This is, why, this is part of, you know, remembering our past, remembering the gifts that we have as far as children of light is concerned. All right. Whenever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them, Matthew 18, 20. That's not one or two. <laughs> okay? That's a million people. This is, the, this is a picture of Count John Hay in Baguio, January 25, 27, 2018. This is the thing. 2019, sorry. This is the Light in the Lord retreat. Where leaders and members of Corpus for Christ gather. That is the map 
Huh? That is the enlightened space that God is showing us. Alright? Let's look at the numbers. The Holy Spirit has used compass for Christ to establish God enlightened spaces, homes where one experiences the hidden presence of the risen Christ. Right? Now, in the Philippines, Metro Manila Mission. Ta -da 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 87,698 mission areas. No? In the whole of the Philippines, the Philippine missions. Four hundred sixty-nine thousand seven hundred fifty mission areas. Right? In terms of international missions. 117,667 Bishop Elias. Oops, what's happening here? Oh. Okay. It's black. <laughs> but you know, you know the CFC chapter who has the greatest number of mission areas in the international scene? Of course, it's the Philippines. <laughs> But in the international scene, do you know the, 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 the country that has the highest mission area? It's not America. It's not Canada. It's not China. It's the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> they have 24 mission areas. And a mission area is like, you know, Australia. It has complete ministry. It has complete governance. A mission area of UAE, all right, where... 100% of their leaders tight is the largest, has the largest mission area all over the CFC region. Do you know how many mission, how many mission volunteers do we have in Australia? Eight? Seven. We have one full-time worker, right? You know how many mission volunteers Canada has? Ask me how many. <laughs> 48. These 48 mission volunteers of Canada, all of them are given salaries like ordinary workers in Canada. So I asked Ricky Cuenca, Ricky Cuenca is the head of you know, Canada. Ricky, how can you manage, for, how can you acquire 48 mission volunteers? And he says, oh, I got them all from the Philippines. <laughs> and he says, well, don't the Philippines complain about what you're doing? You're taking the mission volunteers out of the Philippines into Canada. Oh, the Philippines has so many. <laughs> don't worry. So what do they, what does he do? He invites people from the Philippines to come to Canada. And then he organizes the papers so that they become permanent residents of Canada. And then they pay them. That's the number. You know, you know what the mission area of Canada is? Africa. You know, we yeah, say, oh, we have a, in the Oceania region, we have a mission area of Papua New Guinea, Solomon Island, and Vanuatu, all right? I think Vanuatu is a, is a recreational place. I mean, in New Caledonia, oh, we don't speak English there, they speak French, French there. But these people in Canada, they go to, they go to Africa, Congo, you know, uh, the southern, Sierra Leone, you know, uh, AIDS, uh, war, guerrilla war, etc. That's the kind of mission that they have. And what do they bring there? God, enlightened space. Brothers and sisters, if we are not into this, you know, we have to claim being children of the light. And being children of the light, we have to bring that. Christ and light and space to even greater than Canada, than Australia, United Arab Emirates. We have to bring that God and light and space greater than where we are right now. All right. So, where, we, where are we right now? This is the total picture. The total of approximately 335,000 God and light and homes comprising about 700,000 individuals. This is in the international scene. In the Philippines, there will be millions. But let's look at Australia. Right? I think Brother Danny gave me these statistics. 
CFC Australia, about 700 God-enlightened homes. Ah, little as we are, we make our own, you know, our own task of being Christian, of being children of light. 4,700 individuals, CFCs, SFCs, homes, soul, wives, and cases. Give your hand an applause. They congratulate you. <laughs> of course, when I tell you that, there's a but. Right? <laughs> and the but is, <laughs> I don't know if you can read this. This is the daddy, that your bro brother daddy gave this to me as part of the clergy congress. He said, the total Catholic population in Australia is 5 million, 5.4 million Catholics out of a population of 25 million, right? Roughly around a fifth are Catholics, no? Out of that, total parishes, there are 1,281 parishes. We saved one that was about to close, you know? There was a church in Adelaide that was about to close because they only have seven parishioners and the last parishioners died. <laughs> so there were six parishioners. And you know how that parish was served? Copas for Christ went there and they sing in the mass and they pop and they occupy the space and the priest says, oh, there is hope. I'm not going to close this church anymore. So two is still two. You see, there's 1,281 parishes, right? It could have been 1,280 if I speak, right? But there's 1,281. Out of these 1,281 parishes, CFC members are in 139 of them. And that doesn't mean that there is CFC in those parishes, right? It's just that their members happen to be belonging to that parish. So how much do we serve? In those 1,281 parishes, CFC serves in only 82 of them. Only 82. So out of our membership of 4,700, it comprises, I cannot believe it, it's so small, 0.09% <laughs> of CFC members. 0.09% are CFC members among all the Catholics. And God is saying, I need you. I need your help to bring about this God-enlightened space to all those people. Will you accept the challenge? Do I say yes or no? <laughs> Our call. You know, remember this picture? God is knocking at that door. Are you going to open it for him? Revelation 3.20 Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Zacchaeus, no? Huh? A small man went up to the tree. He wants to see the Lord. He wants to follow the Lord. And what did the Lord say? Come down, Zacchaeus. I will be at your house tonight. I'm going to have dinner with you tonight. How beautiful that English is. Every time, you know, the household leader calls on you. We're going to have a household meeting. Christ will be there. I'm so busy. <laughs> Being under Satan's yoke. Right? <laughs> Oh, oh, I have something else to do. I cannot be bothered. I don't care. Your household leader called you. We're going to have a chapter assembly. Huh? Busy again. Right? But Sakeo is a simple man. After being, after him, I will have dinner with you tonight. And Sakeo is prepared. Right? Luke 19, 1 to 10. Right? Our life in the Spirit. Right? What is this? All this resulted in our transformation into a new life as children of light. Our God enlightened space comes to us because of being our children of light. You know, how, how, did, you know, how did this Christ enlightened space happen? 
because we are children of light. We remember all these things, but then we also need to understand why this is happening to us. You know, my apologies, right? But in the Filipino language, understanding is translated as Anyone? Paliwana. Right? Paliwana. Understanding in Filipino, paliwana, liwanagin, nagliwana, meaning light was brought into that milieu. Huh? Understanding means light is being brought into that milieu. Not any kind of light. Christ light. Right? So, a life of prayer, scripture, sacrament, service, and fellowship. Wow, I remember that. I remember that. That is talk number... <laughs> talk number 10, isn't it? The spokes. You remember this? The spokes. Right? And this is what we have. How, how are we going to understand that light? By being faithful to our prayer time. By reading the scriptures. By our sacrament. Receiving the sacrament. By our service. By our fellowship. To our fellow members. So let's discuss this. Life of prayer. A life of prayer consists in being habitually in God's presence. It is as if we are raring to be and are practicing here and now to enter and be in heaven. Heaven being in communion in God's presence. Praying is entering heaven in the beginning of eternal life. But there's a life of prayer. There's a life of prayer in each one of us. Yeah? What are our covenant says? The covenant says 15 minutes every day. And sometimes the leader... You know, because you have to pray for a lot of people, you know, 15 minutes is not enough. You know, here is what prayer means. You know, I go to, I live about one hour away. My work and my workplace is about an hour away by train. You <laughs> can just imagine. By train, every day, one hour going in, one hour going out. One hour going in, I pray the rosary. I didn't know how it started. But when I think about it, I know where I knew where it came from. Because as a little boy, I saw my mom praying the rosary every time we ride the jeep. You know? And out of the blue I said, I think I'll say the rosary myself. Right? This is my rosary. Uh, sometimes, most of the times, I don't finish it. After the second uh, mystery, I fell asleep, right? But then, then I wake up in the city center. Oh, I continue. I know the third center. I know that. Yeah? Many people say, oh, but saying the rosary is a bit, you know, uh, it's a dull drum, you know, it's something too repeat, repetitive. But still, it's a prayer. You know, one, one, one fellow I read said, you know, to make your prayer time, you know, uh, something that you will actually go through. You time bound. There are many ways to pray, right? You can say the rosary. You can read the. You can pray the scriptures. You can, you know, uh, recite the mercy, divine. divine mercy, right? You can. There's so many sorts of prayer. Or you can read about the saints. Or you can, you know, you can read about, you know, uh, the uh, in steps. Or you can read about so many ways of prayer. You know. But he says, in order to make that discipline, you time bound each one of them. So you say, for example, for these two weeks, I'm going to say the rosary. For the next two weeks, I'm going to read, pray the Psalms. For the next two weeks, I'm going to, you know, read about the scriptures, etc. During my prayer time. All of that is something that gives life to your prayer time. You know? Because sometimes, you know, if you were... Like, if you were like me, I always forget. You know, oh, I forgot to say the rosary. Never mind. 
Say that I said it again. Because you have two weeks to do it. Yeah? They forget, oh, I forgot to bring my brain the sounds. Never mind. Bring the, you know, you have two weeks. Bring the brain in love. The brain in prayers. The brain in sounds again. You time bound those things, right? Now, scriptures. You know? The study of the scriptures. To read the Bible without the Holy Spirit is like opening a book in the dark. So when you read about the scriptures, be sure that you pray with the Holy Spirit. And so how do we read the scriptures? You know, we have, we have to read it with an understanding. We have to read the scriptures in a kind of understanding that can only come from the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus promises? I will give you the counselor who will make you understand all these things that I have said. So reading the scriptures, you know, has to be with the Spirit. Sacrament, reconciliation and communion. How, what does the Catholic, Catechism of the Catholic Church say about reconciliation? You must consent, confess your sin at least once a year. Can you imagine that? Once a year. Alright? I remember attending this uh, MD program. Yeah, so you know the MDs, whenever they become mission volunteers, they come to a process of uh, interview with us. So I sat in one of them, right? And one of these young fellow, a uh, young, young woman, the lady, sat there and we were, you know, giving her all the questions. Bang, 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 questions, left and right, left and right. And she was answering it, right? And one, one of the elders said, how many times do you go to confession? You know what she answered? Every week. Wow. <laughs> Every week she goes to confession. Every week she talks to the priest about her sins, about her past forgiven sins, about her doubts, about her feelings. Every week. And I said, my God, Make this a mission volunteer. <laughs> Pass, take, tick, 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 pass her. Give her, give her to us. She is now serving as mission volunteer. But the Catholic Church, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says only once a year. Right? And make sure it's Easter. <laughs> or before Easter. Communion. It's the Eucharist. When we take the Eucharist, when we take that perfect sacrifice of the Lord, you know, as I told you, we are also kingdom priests. We need to give up that kind of sacrifice that Christ has given as well. What am I to give, my Lord? When I take that communion, you know, what in me is unified to this Eucharist that I am taking? You know? Is it my uh, foregoing Netflix? Is it foregoing my Facebook? Is it for God? What am I dying from that makes me worthy of that Eucharist that I am taking from the Lord? Right? Service! Alright. <laughs> There's a lot of service in Corpus Christi. Right? I don't know if you know all of them, but I'll, I'll rattle off some of them. Uncle, yeah, that's our work with the poor. Right? You know, we have a graduate who become late, uh, the last graduate of that was a cum laude in accountancy, right? And by the way, we have Chris Cardari, who is the minister, who is minister right now, is a cum, our work with the poor, right? So if you, if you need, you know, some scholarship, you better approach him, etc. He'll give you scholarship, etc. No, no, but we're not allowed to help the people in Australia. We're only allowed to help people outside of the develop, of, of developing countries, right? Cornerstone School. You know what a Cornerstone School is? It's about teaching the trainers. It's about our volunteers, SFCs, etc., or young, uh, young, work, young couples, being able to teach our teachers, all right, on early education about Cornerstone. That's Cornerstone. You know, we have this program started at Ateneo, then we have that program. Right now, the latest is Papua New Guinea. You 
you know? Sister Delma built up a school for early education, and that became our cornerstone, right? Army personnel and wives, you know? Prisoner evangelized. I attended a concert of uh, Eric Jenkins. He was a world-renowned pianist. But his ministry is the prison ministry. You know, he, he plays his concert, he brings along his violinists and cellists into the prison camp in order to play for the prisoners. So we ask, somebody asked him, why do you bring the you know, concert? This is concert that is really, wow. When my wife and I watch it, it was like watching him at the opera house. World class, world renowned pianist. And if you have Spotify, you can search him. The name is Eric Genuis. And I ask the question, why do you go to the prison? Because the prisoners cannot come to my concert. So I go to them. And he said this one thing. He said, you know, most of the prison, most of the prisoners that I met in America, they don't even know what a violin is. And he says, can you imagine if they were young and they were introduced to music, to violin, or to beauty, they would not have been criminals. They would not have been living in that cage. If only they have been introduced to beauty. And he says, you know why? Because where there is beauty, there is God. Wow. And I said, yeah, it sounds like. It, you know, you know when, when we go and we, in SFC, we come up with presentation, or you know, you come to your assembly and you give us cheering, and there was beauty into it, you can almost feel God in it. And that this morning before we give the talk, you know, Brother Joe was giving us a praise and worship, a, 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 a pray over. You know, I don't know if you sense it, but I sense that there was beauty in what he was praying us for. And I approach him, he says, you know, Brother Joe, I felt God in your prayer. There was simplicity. There was beauty in what he was praying for us. You know, we were all there, sitting, standing, and he was praying for us. And that soft voice and those words were like God talking to us. There was beauty in it. And I felt that there was God. The same with this guy, Genesis. He said, if there was only beauty in the world. You know, most of us, you know, what kind of music does your children listen to? What kind of, you know, uh, movie, TV program do they listen to? Are there beauty in that? What was the latest? What was the latest TV program? My wife and I were laughing about it. Oh my God. It was a date, real time date. <laughs> What's that? You know, they have a date and then they put it on real TV, real, oh, yeah. real time TV. And they watch about it and they laugh about it. They says, what's beautiful in that? You know? Change the channel. Uh, NBA will be. <laughs> there will be beauty in NBA. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of smart that, you know, TV, etc. were throwing at us. No wonder these people come to the boss have this machine gun and kill everyone else there. But there was no beauty in there. But wherever there is beauty, then all of these things will happen. No? Alright. Service. Right? Service. Service. More service. Migrant worker service. Right? Our journey to God in light and spaces. 205 full-time pastoral workers and mission workers. You probably work in a company where there are 50 workers or 50 employees. Compass for Christ, you know, has 205, right? And these are only in this country. 97 in Metro Manila, 22, 30, 19, 15, 17, 20 in Africa and Europe.
mission centers, right? Mission houses, right? Mission houses that are situated, real estate buildings <laughs> that are established all over the world. These are the God enlightened spaces that we have. Understanding. Now we come to fellowship. Fellowship is not just about eating. <laughs> fellowship is not just about, oh no, let, let's, uh, out of the prayer meeting, let's have a fellowship. It means you know, bring out the food, etc. Miss the point, brothers and <laughs> sisters. Fellowship is about getting, bonding together. You know, imbibing that relationship that you have with one another. Alright? Saying, you know, how are you? How is your children? How is everything else in your family? I want to know. You know, what was the latest book that you were reading? You know, did you know about this thing? Did you know about that? That's fellowship. And that is only beautiful. Uh, and that is not only about current events, but it comes from the Holy Spirit. Fellowship is being one, brothers and sisters. We used to have a song back in the old days. Hine Matob. Right? Hine Matob. Right? We sing about that. It's good and it's, it's good and happy to be with brothers and sisters. That's fellowship. Right? That's fellowship. Oh, okay. And I, and I told you that that is our fellowship. Right? This was our you know, National Council household before. This is about, you know, having a picnic and eating together. This is about presenting the beauty of handmaids, you know, presenting the beauty of, of their talents and creative talents about it. This is about a sports day. This is all fellowship. Right? When we come together and spend time to give with one another. A community, well, let's read that. Can you read this to me? A community that cherishes the little details of love, whose members care for one another and create an open and evangelizing environment is a place where the risen Lord is present, sanctifying it in accordance with the Father's plan. And with that, brothers and sisters, I'd like to call on my second share, Noel and Cora. Where are you? Nation letter. <laughs> yeah, we are guilty of that. But by the way, <laughs> the doctors and the nurses, um, uh, my close friends were also attending. So I was encouraged by that. 